in a lot of ways, there are people who are uneducated about menopause because that's not what they're dealing with, right? To be thrown into medical menopause after surviving cancer is another hurdle. It's another trauma that you have to deal with. But if you are are looking at that and understanding that ahead of time, then you can prepare for it in a way that makes it a lot easier for you to manage. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm super thrilled to have my next guest here, the one and only Stacey London, who is the co-founder and CEO of State of Menopause. You may recognize Stacey from TLC's What Not to Wear or Love, Lust, or Run, um, but she was also a fashion editor at for Vogue and for Mademoiselle and a style contributor for the Today Show. And now she's focusing on health and women's health and making women more comfortable and knowledgeable as they enter that thing called menopause. And and even if you are not a, a woman, um, I think that it is really important for you to listen to what Stacy is talking about and what she's doing on State of Menopause, because I think we all know women and we all can help <laughs> women along the way. So I hope that you will be as excited as I am to talk to and listen to uh, Stacy and really hear her inspiration behind getting involved in this company and transition from fashion guru to entrepreneur. So welcome, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me, Kara. How are you? Good. Very Good. excited to have you here. So thank you so much. So I want to hear like the early days of Stacy. So, um, you know, what what was going on with you in the early days? I mean, I I know that you were definitely uh, heavily involved in the fashion industry. So I'm just curious, like what I mean, what, like, what did you think you wanted to do? do. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm, no. I'm interrupting you. I was laughing because I was like, what you're saying, what, you know, when, what were the early days of Stacy like? I'm like, which Stacy? Because I feel like I've already lived so many lives. I love um, it. But I guess you're, you're, you're referring to my early days in fashion. Yes. No, no early day, Like young, who was young Stacy? Oh, young Stacy, little Stacy, like little, little Stacy. Well, little Stacy only wore purple uh, pretty much until the age of four. Oh, um, I only like dresses and I only wore patent leather Mary Janes. And I was Dorothy for Halloween like eight times in a row because I loved ruby slippers. I did not have a thing for gingham, but I put up with gingham to get the ruby slippers. So in other words, I loved everything sparkly and I loved fish at stockings. So the only thing I could think of to be when I grew up was a cocktail waitress because I didn't know about hookers and I didn't know about strippers and I didn't know that you could wear fishnets as like a regular person. So, oh um, God. yeah, that's, that's a, that's a little window into uh, little Stacy's like aspirational life. I'm dying. So how did you transition into fashion then? Well, I, I mean, I, I really think that it was always there, right? I was always, I was always fascinated by the visual and the eye catching and, I think that, you know, fa the fashion industry, as I've said many times before, is is an industry that I think is built on uh, some kind of insecurity, right? And even when I was a teenager, I remember wanting, you know, to feel cool and in and beautiful and and like be, you know, knowledgeable about things before they happened and, you know, be on the cutting edge of pop culture. And fashion was all of those things. Uh, so for me, it was kind of a no brainer thinking that I, you know, wasn't cool or beautiful or in the know or any of that to, to be attracted to an industry that would provide that for me or would give me some sort of external validation in that regard. And, you know, I found out very quickly that that's why a lot of people are attracted to, to the fashion industry. And, you know, <clears throat> There's very high price put on youth and beauty and being thin and things like that. And I realized very quickly that that, that is an industry, but that it sort of preys on the, the worst impulses and instincts in us instead of what I really loved, which was style, which has nothing to do with the industry and everything to do with who you are as a person and what you personally want to say and express about yourself 
through the way you dress, behave. You know, when I say style, it's everything. It's what you eat. It's where you live. It's how you dress. It's, it's all of the things it's, you know, what kind of content you consume. And so I, I kind of have had this trajectory from what the fashion industry taught me, which was certainly how to style, you know, high fashion. I, my first photographer that I ever worked with was Irving Penn. I mean, you know, talk about an idol. Um, it was amazing, but I also, you know, worked in, in magazines for a long time. I was an assistant at Vogue for a while, and then I was an assistant at Mademoiselle, and then I went freelance and became a freelance stylist and went back to Mademoiselle magazine when it was still around as the fa senior fashion editor. Um, and then I got fired, which I say this again, understanding that some people are not in a position to lose their job. But for me, I recommend that everybody get fired at some point because I, I really do believe it, it, it puts things in perspective in a way that nothing else does. Because when, when somebody says, Hey, not you or no to you anymore, then it really forces you to figure out what is the next tributary? What is the next Avenue? What is the next path? that you need to take, that the universe is sort of saying, hey, move in this way. Um, and I spent the next year styling people in bank commercials and children in high C commercials and doing things that were far less glamorous than, you know, working at Vogue or Mademoiselle or any magazine and, you know, learning how to dress men and figuring out how to dress real people, all of which led me to audition for What Not to Wear. Um, you know, a television show that one, I never thought I would get cast for. And two, when I did, I thought, oh, I'll do 10 episodes and I'll go back to styling people and I'll be able to charge a little bit more money. Um, instead, you know, that led to the biggest career change of my life, a show that lasted 10 years. Um, I went on to do Today and Access Hollywood and Oprah. I became a spokesperson for Pantene and Dr. Scholes and Woolite and Lee Jeans all because of this one show. And the trajectory of my life completely changed. Um, it also led me to realize that, you know, the idea of transformative makeovers in style was very becoming, you know, was very quickly becoming kind of out of date in terms of what people were doing in unscripted television and game shows and competition shows and uh, shows about getting married and without knowing somebody or the bachelorette and, and uh, shows about people, you know, struggling with obesity became the norm, you know, sort of real housewives became what was unscripted. It was no longer prescripted. And I realized that fashion stopped being about how to dress, right? We, that's the generation that I came from and certainly what television was like in the early aughts. But we don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in a prescriptive fashion world. We live in a in an experiential, shared experiential, me too uh, fashion world where we don't ask people to dictate what we're wearing. We figure it out for ourselves and we're attracted to people who sort of like the same style that we do. So instead, you know, I, I, I think about it as magazines, then television. And even when I was in television, I kept hearing about the rise of the blogger. And I was like, what in the hell is a blogger, right? And then from bloggers, we got influencers. And that's what you see in social media today. Those are people who, yes, may be paid for wearing something or promoting something, but it was based on their style that they built an audience, not that they were telling other people how to dress. They invested in creating their own brands that people were then attracted to. That's a very different kind of influence than being a, a quote unquote expert, right? And I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do on television anymore because one, I'd lost interest in, in how to dress people. I feel like if you, if you've seen one, what not to wear, you've seen them all, right? You know what our rules are. And I think that for the most part, we started to create a very cookie cutter image of people instead of allowing people to be who they are, to truly personally express themselves. Um, and on my second show, Love, Lust, or Run, I, I got to do a lot more of that. Really um, investigate the idea of transmission versus translation. What do I want to say about myself and what do other people see me saying about myself? How do we disconnect and connect those two things? So interesting. I think like the one thing that I 
I admire a lot of things about you, but the one thing I really admire about you is the fact that it seems like you let things run their course, right? And one of the reasons, one of the things that I share with audiences a lot is that I went from tech to starting a beverage company. And it's, uh, and for me, I, when I left tech, it wasn't the tech was terrible or bad or people weren't mean to me. I mean, there were days that they, I felt like they were mean to me, whatever, but it wasn't like, that wasn't the issue as much as I wanted to go and do something that I didn't understand and I didn't learn. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel like I see in your career that, you know, people have a hard time saying, oh my gosh, like Stacy went from fashion and magazines then to TV and whatever, but it all really makes sense. And I think it just goes along with the learning and what you're really passionate about. And so I, um, so obviously this, the company, the state of menopause, you jumped into that. Can you share a little bit more about what inspired you to get there? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, sort of where I left off after, you know, doing television and and doing um, guest hosting on The View and things like that, I I really started to get fewer and fewer phone calls about doing television and and makeovers, Hmm. partly because I think makeovers went out of style, but it was hard not to take that sort of personally, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I went out in 2019 to LA to pitch to a bunch of television networks and streamers an idea for a show that was not just about sort of fashion transformation, but that focused on midlife transformation to take a midlife crisis to a midlife renaissance because I had been experiencing all of these kind of midlife crises myself. And it started with, I don't look like myself. I don't feel like myself. Nobody's calling me anymore. I feel like I've been passed over. I'm kind of culturally irrelevant. And I don't think that you have to leave a TV show or anything like that to experience that feeling in Mm -hmm. middle age. I mean, this is what our kind of patriarchal culture does to women in midlife. Um, And, you know, add to that, it's the highest rate of divorce, depression, decreased earning potential, which I felt very afraid of and scared about. Um, And I wanted to make a show where we talked about the kind of reinvention and the pivot that is possible in midlife, particularly for women who are facing all sorts of these kinds of challenges, as well as raising children or empty nest syndrome, elder care or dying parents. I mean, this is a very pressure cooker moment in our lives. And it would be one thing if we were still dying at 60 or 65, but now we're living into our nineties. I was like, there's a entire runway of life in front of us. And we are looking at middle life as if it's the end Mm -hmm. when really it's an incredible transitory, um, iterative moment for, for us. Um, I, and I pitched that idea basically to crickets. Nobody, nobody, everybody said to me, nobody will watch a television show about middle-aged women. And I left feeling, I left LA feeling very deflated. But what I also didn't know was that a lot of what I was experiencing wasn't just external invalidation, right? It was the fact that my hormones had started to go a little bit wonky and I had no idea what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. So while I was being faced with kind of what is this career crisis, what is this life crisis, I didn't realize that after having spine surgery in 2016, I attributed a lot of what I was feeling to the severity of the surgery, Mm -hmm. that I was anxious, that I was depressed, that I was having mood swings, that I was angry. I thought this is like, I really traumatized my body by Mm -hmm. having this surgery. And this is the reaction, right? And they said to me, oh yes, you know, we don't tell you that before, but it is possible. So we we, we don't like to put that in your head in case, you know, we're we're suggesting it to your brain. And I was like, first of all, you should have told me Mm -hmm. because here I am struggling with this and I don't know what to do with it. I kept going to my doctors and saying, I don't look like myself. I don't feel like myself. My skin is changing. My sex drive fell through the floor, you know, sex became painful. All of a sudden I couldn't sleep. Then I started having brain fog and forgetting nouns. And just as I was like really coming out of recovering, it took 18 months of PT to to get past that surgery. My father got very sick and I spent 
March of 2018 until November of 2018, until he died, taking care of him with my family. And I started to did to develop symptoms that were very similar to what he was experiencing. He had a heart disease. I started having heart palpitations. He was having trouble sometimes keeping food down because his organs weren't working properly. And I started having food allergies where I would wind up throwing things up that I'd been able to eat my whole life. He would get a skin rash. I would get a skin rash. All of which I thought were the physical manifestations of fear and grief about losing my dad. Those two events, the surgery and losing my father, bookend what was really the worst of my perimenopausal symptoms, including hot flashes, night sweats, all of it. Mm. But I didn't realize that menopause had anything to do with it. One, I thought it happened to other people. Two, I thought it was optional. Three, I thought if it happened to me, it was like old, you know, old, old, old women got it. And I also just didn't understand what the, what the actual symptoms and issues surrounding menopause were. So my brain Hmm. did mental gymnastics, trying to figure out why I felt so terrible. And of course, both of these, you know, events were really very difficult and they involved pain, both emotional and physical and grief and loss. So they certainly amplified my perimenopausal experience. I don't think they caused it. I think they just made it Mm -hmm. worse. And because I have a lot of autoimmune diseases, I couldn't go on hormones. And I was really white knuckling through the whole thing, going to doctors and saying, I'm afraid I have Alzheimer's. I can't remember nouns. Going to doctors and saying like, I can't stop crying or I can't get out of bed and being thrown anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants. And I was like, I don't, want this. I don't want you to treat the problem. I want you to help me figure out what's going on holistically. And it took for a company to come to me and say, Hey, we're beta testing products for menopausal people. Would you get involved in this for me to start doing my own homework and for me to start being my own health advocate? And I started beta testing these products. It was a brand that I loved. And when I I realized the parent company was going to sunset the brand because they felt like they wanted to move away from CPG and into tech. I thought, oh no, this is my opportunity to acquire the brand and make the company that I wish I'd had when I was so confused by what I was going through, which really started at around 44 or 45. And certainly I still, uh, you know, have some menopausal issues, even though I'm post-menopausal. Why wasn't there any education? Why wasn't anybody able to recommend product to me? Why was everything hormonal? Why was nothing over the counter? Where was all of the help and support to normalize and destigmatize this issue? It, it didn't exist. So interesting. So from that came state of menopause yes. and you became, uh, you call yourself the co-founder and you're the CEO. So what yes. is the mission of the company? Well, the mission of the company, obviously, is to provide provide acute symptomatic relief through product. But further than that, obviously, is that we... We talk about the eyes, right? This idea that we want to destigmatize menopause. Of course, we should destigmatize it. That's a no brainer to me. And contextualize menopause is a much bigger uh, mission for the company, meaning that we need to look at this in terms of the lifespan of uh, hormonal health. And, you know, we just keep forgetting to talk about this exit on the highway of life, right? We talk about uh, puberty. We talk about pregnancy. We talk about infertility, postpartum, things that maybe even five years ago didn't get the discussion that they're getting. But menopause, seeing it as the end of fertility uh, brings up, I think, a lot of associations, uh, both consciously and unconsciously. This idea that we can no longer have biological children is a, a form of secondary grief, certainly a kind of loss. Um, I think sociologically, we look at it as sort of being past your expiration date. And if you are no longer fertile, what is your contribution to society, right? That's that's physiological, that's biological. But societally, we all know that women contribute to our society in many more ways than just being able to give birth. There are tons of women who are not able to have children, and that doesn't make their contributions any less significant. And certainly women who don't want children, and that doesn't make their contributions any less significant. It's sort of like our our society has kind of far outrun our physiology. But what I think we're seeing is that as our lifespans get longer, women are having children later. 
right? There is going to be a point where you, it will be very easy for women um, to have children well into their 40s and 50s. We're just not there yet, right? So this idea that menopause is some kind of an end is really, is really such a misconception because we're in middle life. We're not at the end of life. We're in the middle. So for us to contextualize menopause as one more stop in this kind of lifespan of hormonal health is very important. And when we think about normalizing it, it's not even just about talking about it. It's like who we're talking to. How are we normalizing this with our physicians? How are we normalizing this with our significant others, with our children, with our friends, with the people that we need as a support group, as a support system to help us during this phase of life, which can be complicated, confusing, and uncomfortable. And then we need to think about how are we optimizing this phase of life? How are we looking at it as an opportunity to, as a reclamation of our time after being, you know, people who have been caretakers for most of their lives in one way or another, how can we reclaim this time as ours? How can we reclaim this time to pivot, to be something different, to stop caring for others and putting our self-actualization first? That's a huge opportunity. And we need to also optimize that by education about what's happening to you and products that assist in you feeling your best and being your best. And then I think we need to democratize it. So it is very easy to think about menopause as a middle-class, white woman, cisgender, heteronormative, vanity problem instead of the health issue that it is for anybody, however you identify with female reproductive organs, that 52% of the population is going to face, that 1 billion people in less than 36 months are going to be in that phase of their life. That's 12% of the Earth's population. And this can last for a third to a half of your lifetime. That is a lot of people who need more education and more help around this. And that's both education about taking hormones like HRT or bioidenticals and over-the-counter products that are affordable and easily available to you. That's the mission of this company. All of those eyes, as I like to call them, right? We, we want you to feel better now, but feeling better now is in the context of a societal acceptance of what this stage of life looks and feels like and what it means for our own growth and self-actualization. So interesting. So what do you think is like the hardest challenge that you've had in taking on uh, this? I mean, you're, you changed the company a bit, um, yeah. you know, when you came in and sort of the purpose of it. But what, what has been really the hardest thing it, as you're thinking about your consumer? Like, what's that hurdle that you have to get over in order to get them to um, engage? Yeah. I mean, I think that the most important thing really is, you know, aside from brand awareness, which, you know, as mm -hmm. we are a very small startup, we have put no money towards paid advertising. We have put no money towards um, even uh, marketing emails. We just started being able to have an, um, a tech stack integrated enough for us to start sending marketing emails to our consumers. So Basically, the only way anybody's ever known about us is like screaming into the void of social media that is finally starting to change. So, you know, again, first hurdle is always going to be brand awareness. Second hurdle is getting this consumer to feel comfortable talking about a very stigmatized conversation, a very stigmatized topic. And that is, for me, really about listening to the consumer and meeting them where they're at. So if you don't mm -hmm. want to scream from the rooftops about menopause the way I do, right? I want to like shine lights all over. Where are the floodlights so we can talk about this topic? You, I want to do that so you don't have to. And it's part of the mm -hmm. reason that starting this company as a D2C e-com company was so important to me. Because if you're not, if you don't feel comfortable, you should be able to go online, be able to take a quiz or shop by concern and really figure out whether or not you're in menopause or if this could be another situation where you need uh, medical advice. You know, you never have to see a doctor in menopause if you don't want to. You can see naturopaths. Mm -hmm. There are a ton of ways to, you know, come at this phase of life. But the idea is that so many people are uneducated. It's so hard to connect the dots, both to mm -hmm. symptoms and to what is going on with you hormonally, that the real hurdle 
isn't just brand awareness or even meeting you where you're at in terms of your level for, uh, you know, consuming things or information about things that feel uh, stigmatizing and shameful, right? It is about how do we educate you so that you have more agency over what your choices are going to be at this stage of life. Education here is just, a, it's a tenpole for what any mm -hmm. company that is, you know, trying to serve a community around menopause is going to have to do. You know, I could not have connected the dots until I looked back at them. And we don't want yeah. to have people experiencing menopausal symptoms and understanding them in hindsight. We want you to be prepared for them so that when you do go through menopause, you're very clear on what is happening. If you know and understand something about an experience before it happens, it impacts the way you experience it, right? The more you know, the more you know. And that's very much, I think, the job of the menopause companies that you see operating today, whether it's for product or telehealth or pharmacies or hormones, all of these things and all of these companies, we are all working together to serve a community that's confused. And, I, and hopefully, I think um, Gen X will be the last generation that really suffers from the kind of internalized shame around this topic, because we have mm -hmm. younger generations that are systemically dismantling all other kinds of things that we have had shame around, sexuality, gender, even issues with race. So when it comes yeah. to health and ages, so I think that, you know, we're going to meet in the middle. We're going to meet. Yeah. In and like you said, right? we're, we're living longer. And this is something that, you know, unfortunately, if you don't get it under control, um, depression, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, that's probably the first thing that starts well, to mood and skin, which are basically right. ruled by progesterone are pro progesterone is usually the first hormone that starts to decrease. And so, you know, you're going to see differences and you're going to feel differences. And again, that can start as early as 38 and that's natural mm -hmm. chronological menopause. Um, and you know, then there's surgical menopause, which can happen at any age. If you have a radical hysterectomy or an oophorectomy that will put you in menopause, surgical menopause can be because of, uh, endometriosis, PCOS, uh, sorry, I, I was just saying surgical, but medical, uh, can happen if you are taking tamoxifen, if you have breast cancer, um, any kind of chemotherapy can throw you into menopause. Uh, stem cell um, replacement can can throw you into menopause. So age isn't just the only factor here. Um, there hmm. are other ways in which we come to menopause, and we, you know, it is not your oncologist's job to tell you. Um, you're going to be in medical menopause. Your oncologist's job is to tell you that we're going to cure your cancer or, you know, mm -hmm. do whatever we can to cure your cancer. So in a lot of ways, there are people who are uneducated about menopause because they never, that's not the, that's not what they're dealing with, right? To be thrown into medical menopause after surviving cancer is another hurdle. It's another trauma that you have to deal with. But if you are, are looking at that and understanding that ahead of time, then you can prepare for it in a way that makes it a lot easier for you to manage. And so share some of the products that you, that you do have, um, sure. that you're offering um, to consumers. Yeah. I mean, well, we're always growing and our product roadmap is really based on what we have heard from our consumers. So uh, I really highly recommend going to stateofmenopause.com and checking in regularly and signing up for our newsletter because you will be the first to hear about our new product drops. But right now we, we focus on products in four categories. In cooling, obviously for hot flashes and hot flushes. So we have cooling spray. We also have a cooling gel face moisturizer. And a lot of people ask me, well, why? And, you know, interestingly enough, one of the things that happens uh, to a lot of people in menopause is you get cystic acne, you can have pre-rosacea, there's a lot more redness and broken blood vessels in the skin. So we wanted to come up with a face moisturizer that is a cooling gel that still provides, again, you know, if you're feeling hot or your skin feels red and hot, that it soothes your skin, um, but also is not as thick as a cream. So that if you are struggling with clogged pores and cystic acne, this is a great way to get hydration without the heaviness. And then there are people who say to me that they almost have pre-diabetic skin, that it's so dry that it's peeling. And that's, that's kind of what I felt. Like when I started to look at my skin, 
it started to look and feel like sandpaper. So we have a very heavy face cream that is for people who desperately need hydration, which is our second category. And we have a body cream for hydration as well. Um, then we have a relief category, which is for muscle fatigue and joint pain, both of which are pretty prevalent in perimenopause. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about frozen shoulder. So these are things that happen that, uh, again, tingling fingers, things that, it, or digits that, you know, we extremely that we don't um, necessarily connect with menopause. So we make a CBD body oil for that. We make an Arnica hand and joint cream for that. Um, and then we have a strength category, which is about broken and thinning hair and brittle nails, things like that. These are all things that you see at the beginning stages of perimenopause um, and certainly into perimenopause. And as we start to build out our product development, what we are really looking to solve for are acute symptomatic issues so that we have something for you to use in the moment. There's no reason that if you have the right health profile um, that you couldn't be on hormones, something like an estrogen patch, and still want our cooling spray in every single one of your handbags. We are not contraindicated with hormones. Um, some people will not want to take hormones, can't take hormones like me, or, or simply can't afford them, may not even have insurance that covers them, may not even have insurance. So where are we filling in those gaps for things that are easily available, readily affordable, and that mitigate some of the symptoms that you are experiencing in menopause. I love this. And I really think that having that place to answer a lot of those questions that people have too, and also let them know that they're not alone, right? Like I think it de demystifies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, and I you actually just hit the nail on the head. One of the things yeah. that I talk about a lot was that I did not want to, even when I didn't understand what was happening to me, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about how emotional I was feeling. I didn't want to talk about how I felt my body was changing and that I didn't really recognize myself in the mirror because I felt so ashamed mm -hmm. of it. And I didn't realize, like, even if I'd known it was menopause, I wouldn't have wanted to talk about it because I would have felt ashamed about, oh, this is what it means to get old, right? There was so much yeah. internalized shame around this. And had I known that so much of the population is going through it at the same time as I am, I wouldn't have felt alone if I knew that I could talk about it. Totally. If I knew there was somewhere to go, communities to speak with, that we are, you know, in the midst of creating communities for people to be able to say, hey, I need help. Come to us. Yeah. You know, we want to be here for you to talk to. We want to be here for you to understand that you're not alone in this experience because menopause can feel incredibly isolating. And that is also part of my mission, I think, was that I felt so lonely and felt yeah. so embarrassed about what was happening to me. I mean, imagine going to a party and talking to, you know, somebody you really admire or even idolize. And in the middle of that conversation, you look like you have taken a shower in front of them. Yeah. It's weird. It feels yeah. weird, you, you, you know, or you're looking for a word that you cannot, is on the tip of your tongue that you cannot remember. You're, it's embarrassing. Not the end of the world, but embarrassing. And if you haven't slept and if you have brain fog and if you're having hot flashes, all of that starts to really screw with your equilibrium. And if you're depressed and you don't know why, if you're anxious and you don't know why, if you're angry and you don't know why, that makes you feel like you're not yourself. And that yeah. is a very alienating feeling. Well, I love everything about this because you know how I, I love companies that are actually looking out for the consumer and helping uh, humans really yes. figure out what is the best uh, resources to go to, because you're not just, as you mentioned, you're not just about selling your own products. You're really yeah. a community uh, for people. And, and I love, love, love everything that you're doing. So where's the best place for, or what is the website address? Yeah. Do you want to well, I just want to say also, Kara, you know, I feel a, a real kinship with you in exactly what you said. You know, I don't believe in brands that are just making product to make money. I, I, mm -hmm. I one, I, of course, you know, if you, if you start a company that is for profit and a, not a non-for-profit, you, you obviously want to make products that people want and want to buy and that are effective, but it is much more meaningful when there is something behind that idea. 
When that idea is about health, about longevity, about community, about something that has to do with our humanity, rather Mm -hmm. than just like, buy this, you need this because, right? I am really in the midst of what I believe is a real revolution, that we are in the midst of a real revolution in what women's health is going to look like. And for me, that was a really actually natural step from style, because I have always cared about how someone feels whether it's their self-esteem, self-acceptance, self-love, self-awareness. And I did that through clothing for a long time. But it was never about the clothes, right? It was about what the clothes could do. And very much in the same situation, it is not about the products. It is about what the products can do. They can help you mm-hmm. feel better in a, you know, a stage of life that is not always incredibly comfortable. And I don't sugarcoat it, right? I don't believe that it is like, you go girl, you got this. I don't believe in that kind of toxic positivity. Menopause can be hard, but it isn't hopeless and you aren't helpless. And I feel very strongly that that is, you know, the ethos of our company. Um, So you can find us at stateofmenopause.com and certainly follow us on shop state of on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and definitely, you know, go to our website and sign up for our newsletter and you will hear about our latest products first. You will hear about all of my picks from other companies, uh, what it means to live a great life in menopause and all of the things that we think can help you and encourage you to do that. That's incredible. We're, you're so passionate about this and I'm so happy that they, uh, you guys found each other and uh, <laughs> you're running this company. I, I think it's terrific. So many lessons here uh, for people to, um, everything for finding your passion, changing careers, doing things for the right reasons. Um, so thank you so much, Stacy, for coming on. This is absolutely amazing. Everybody needs to come to the site, sign up for the newsletter, and also follow you on social too, because I know oh, yes. you're- I'm just Stacy London Real on Instagram. Amazing. <laughs> and thank you so much. And thanks everybody for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to the Kara Golden Show so that you are sure not to miss all of the incredible creators and disruptors that we have on the show. And please be sure to give Stacy five star rating because it really does make a difference in the algorithm for the show. And I can be found on all social platforms at Kara Golden. If you haven't picked up a copy of my book Undaunted, uh, it's also available on Audible. Definitely uh, check it out. It's uh, my story of building the company that I founded, Hint. And we are here every Monday, Wednesday, and just added Friday as well. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and have a terrific terrific rest of the week. Thanks again, Stacey.